Welcome to the Widely Optimized Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Terea Rodriguez, and I'm joined by the lovely co-host, Evie Tackett. Both of us are functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners, and we love working with women from all over the world through our virtual programs, helping women not only feel better, but actually achieve that vibrant, no holds barred version of themselves they've been missing for a long time. And how we actually get there? Well, that is what this show is all about. Now, please keep in mind that this podcast is created for educational purposes only and should never be used as a replacement for medical diagnosis or treatment. And if you like what you hear today, we would love for you to hit that follow button, leave a review in Apple podcast, share with your friends and keep coming back for more. Let's start today's adventure, shall we? Okay, welcome back, everybody. Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. We have so much feedback about the episode that we did about chocolate last year that uh, we had to just do another episode and find another guest. So we are joined by Jeff Stratman of Mythical Chocolate. Welcome, Jeff, to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to get to sit down and talk about a true passion of ours. Love it. Love it. So tell us a little bit about your company, Mythical Chocolate. I'd love to hear where it got the name and really where did you get your passion for cacao? Yeah. I mean, uh, we could talk a long time about just those three things. Um, So Mythical Chocolates, we are literally a ma and pa chocolate shop based in Bend, Oregon. Uh, And we are hyper-focused on and where kind of the name Mythical comes from is bringing people back into alignment with the origins of cacao. Oftentimes it is viewed as a commodity anymore. Um, A lot of myself included will turn up their noses at uh, different chocolates and things like that because of the ingredients or the sugars or whatever it is in it. So the idea is to recapture the essence of cacao as a superfood and bring together a culmination of pleasure and nourishment, which, uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to just have your heart space kissed open rather than punched open by just raw cacao. So that's what we're focused on. That's really cool. And when did your obsession with cacao and chocolate start? Because I know I have always loved and appreciated chocolate, even as a little kid, but for me personally, about 10 years ago, I discovered something called craft chocolate with, that we talked about a bit in the last episode. And I really started to learn about ingredients and makers and where this stuff comes from and the actual farmers where it comes from. And that really kind of piqued my interest in a way that I nerded out pretty hard on oh, it. Yeah. So where did this spark for you? Yeah, no, that uh, for me personally, it's probably been a 10 to 15 year journey. I don't remember the exact date at this point. Um, But especially in my early 20s coming out of college, I was incredibly into different types of um, fitness and nutrition. It was a humongous passion of mine. And that's where the idea of eating really dark chocolate um, came about as a way for like recovery or being energized into going into these things. And then as that path continued, really flipping over the labels and reading what was in this stuff rather than just grab up, oh, here's a 77% dark chocolate bar. Uh, You realize like all they're really telling you is 33% of this is sugar and they're skipping over all the emulsifiers and the different things that keep it pretty and shelf stable for a year at a time, things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. so especially as, uh, so my wife, Ashley and I, we have two little girls and as we bring them into the world, we're trying to bring so much reverence into what we eat. And in doing that, that's when we really pay attention to what's going in our bodies. And an opportunity came along through our friend, Ryan, to, who's been doing chocolate 
for 15 years, approximately 15 to 20 years, Ryan's been crafting chocolate um, to all partner up and take something that has been integral to our lives and make it in a way that feels in alignment with our own bodies so that we are willing to share with other people. Cool. Very cool. And so when you started, you started with Ryan and you partnered with Ryan. I'm assuming that Ryan was already sourcing cacao in a ethical fashion and was sourcing really good beans and not buying them from Nestle or a big conglomeration, right? So, um, you know, I one of the questions I have is like, why is sourcing the cacao from particular farmers or from particular places important in general across all kinds of chocolate? Yeah, I mean, even just hearing the question makes my skin start tingling because I think this is one of the quintessential aspects of all of this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Ryan was doing the best he could as far as sourcing. And having said that, there's always room for improvements. And that's really what having more minds come together and focus on this, um, we were able to do because we started to talking to other friends who also had ceremonial cacao companies. And where do they get their beans from? What do you recommend? How do you see this? Because um, when you're, you're little, sometimes you feel behooven to the big guy's whims. And we really didn't want to do that anymore. Um, so at each step of this, it's been a constant unfolding of better understanding what it means. So yes, uh, like at this point, it's over a third of all chocolate comes from the Ivory Coast or cacao, what goes into chocolate. Um, so at least our current understanding, uh, as far as cacao, it all originated down in most likely Ecuador and expanding up into the Amazon basin. So the Ivory Coast was not part of that picture. So asking the questions of, okay, it's, you know, uh, at one point we were using cacao from Tanzania, to be honest, um, because we had really good recommendations for this. They were bringing a crop to one of the poorest parts of the world and allowing them the opportunity to make money. And that was beautiful. And they have very, very, very good ethics. So I have nothing against it. Um, but what started unfolding for me is, okay, what does planting this stuff, uh, what did that take away from that natural environment? So for example, in Peru right now, there is uh, farmers who have been growing for somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 years in this one mountain valley. But because cacao is coming from all these different places now and they can grow it so much cheaper in places like Africa, they're literally cutting down these 1,000-year-old groves in order to plant things like limes and mangoes uh, because the locals can make money doing that in comparison to what they were traditionally getting from cacao, which I don't blame them. I would do that. But uh, how do we, as the ones providing this to the people, start really examining the entire chain of events that happens by us demanding this? So we're creating demand. How do we do that in the best way, the most ethical way possible? And I'm always open to continuing to learn more and continuing to develop how we do this. But um, right now, that's what we're trying to really focus on. So that's why not all, but a lot of our beans are wild harvested. Uh, whereas some from that exact same region uh, are cultivated. Interesting. And so let's, let's step back for a minute and just kind of review what are all the steps that are required from growing the cacao to being able to taste and consume the cacao? Can you like summarize all those different steps and what's involved? Because I think a lot of people don't really know that process because we get it off of the, the store shelves, totally. right? So what's in, what's, what leads up to the store shelves and why is it so important that we are paying attention to each step? Yeah. Um, well, I guess there would be, there's going to be different approaches 
So I am happy to speak to ours, um, but kind of the store bought way, a lot of times what you're doing is they're buying cacao from all sorts of different sources and throwing it together into a giant pot. Before it gets there, how they're doing it is they're harvesting the pods. Um, and in order to do it in mass, a lot of times these are just sitting on the ground in order to ripen. That way they can uh, get the trees to continue to bear fruit because it ta- an average tree is producing about 20 pods and it takes about 40 pods to produce uh, one kilogram of chocolate. So it's, it's quite demanding on these natural resources. Um, so after that, they take them and they, the pod is uh, smaller than a football, but it thinks big old football shape. And they crack that open and they pull out all those seeds inside, which is the fruit. And you can eat it and it's very, very, very sweet and much different than what you would find in their chocolate bar. It's almost like a Jolly Rancher or something like that in comparison. Uh, and that goes into a fermentation process. So I think that's really beautiful. A lot of the stuff that we focus on is fermented food. Chocolate is a fermented food. Um, after that, they dry it. And once it's dried, that's typically what's put into big burlap sacks or whatever they're using, and it's shipped wherever it's going. Um, and again, that aspect is one where you have to know your sourcing. A lot of times, uh, how long has this been laying on the ground before it went into fermentation? Uh, after it's packed, uh, we've run into it too, where uh, depending on who you got it from, they're putting things like rocks and straws into those bags in order to increase weight and ship it out. So you need to know you have an ethical source that you're getting this from. Um, so then it comes to whomever and it goes into, this is kind of where the big branch happens between how we're trying to do it and how you might find commercial chocolate. So a lot of them will use, um, these giant steam ovens to superheat the beans and basically cook out any sort of impurities or flavor variances that they wouldn't want. And this stuff gets very, very hot. Um, and from there it might go, some might keep it as a whole bean process. A lot of them, they're going to go into, um, a press. So the press is heating this up to about 400 degrees or so, depending on their machine. And it's pushing all the fat, the, or what we call cacao butter out of the cacao. And then you have the rest of it and it's getting turned into powder. Um, this is done because it makes it easier to have consistent flavor across everything you do. And then, um, depending on who it is, they might do what's called a Dutch processing. Um, so it's a literal chemical, well, that actually would happen first, but it's a literal chemical processing of the beans in order to, again, uh, think of it as put in a, in a simple way, it'd be like, think of an acid bath in order to cook out all the stuff that you don't want it to taste like in order to have a very, very smooth, consistent, very, very dark bean. Most of your cacao is actually pretty red if you look at it. Um, yeah. So. And so what you're describing is the, the typical process with what I would consider highly processed cacao. Right. So we we teach our clients and from the other podcast episode that if they look at the back and the ingredients and they see cocoa butter, cocoa mass, this is what you're talking right. about. You're talking that pressed out resulting powder and the pressed out cacao butter. Right. Because uh, yeah. a cacao bean uh, is nearly 50% fat. So when you go buy cacao powder, most of them report out on there how much fat is left. And you'll see that it's somewhere between 10 to 12% fat is all that's left in it. You might find a higher fat one that's in the 20s. I'm like, congratulations, you found a, a, better, <laughs> you found a better powder. Um, but the fat is one of the biggest drivers between 
behind you receiving the nutritional density of cacao, especially because in order to get it to that point, they have superheated and pressed this uh, bean in order. Um, so some would say that you probably lost somewhere between 60 to 90% of the nutritional value of cacao. Bye-bye superfood. Right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you've, you've got a very consistent, very flavorful, easy to use mass, but you've lost the vast majority of the benefit. Um, so yeah, that, that, and it goes on how they reconstitute it and do all their things. So that right there is one of the biggest branches between what we're trying to do and that process. So there still is a roasting process with cacao. Uh, and so now we're backing up. Now in we're the process, backing, right? backing, 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 backing back to the beans. Now you've got a sack okay. of beans and those beans are put into a roaster. There's many different ways people roast. And this is a lot like coffee where the artistry really starts to come into play. So, um, it's incredibly nerdy. People have huge spreadsheets on, uh, you know, cook it to this temperature and then rotate it and cook it to this temperature and um, rotating this stuff out. And it's absolutely beautiful. And roasting profiles are completely different depending on the bean. So the way you roast a Peruvian bean is different than a Bolivian bean, which is different than a Belize bean. And um, so by doing this, that's where you start to create your spider charts of flavor profiles. So um, basically how chocolatey is this? How sweet is this? And this is before you're adding sugar. How acidic? How bitter? Um, how nutty? How fruity? Those kind of things. And you're examining all of this in order to craft your final product. So uh, we personally are not at the point where we can have a ton of different beans to create the different things. Like in an ideal situation, like on a truffle, you'd have a different bean f for the ganache on the inside versus the coverture. That's the shell on the outside. Um, but after they go through their very nerdy process, their beautiful nerdy process, they crack and winnow it, which means that basically you have the husk on the outside of the actual uh, inside, which is where they uh, break those, and that's where your nibs come from. Um, and the nibs, like I heard uh, you were talking about your bulletproof cacao where you were throwing that in the blender and you were blending those up. That's a great way to yep. make a cacao powder. Now you've got a... A full density, full fat powder. Um, That's right. So once we have nibs, we personally are putting these into a stone grinder. And it is sitting there spinning around for approximately, in our situation, three days. Um, so we're trying to break this down to the absolute micron level because uh, we are focused on that very velvety texture without having to apply a bunch of heat. That's why I was illustrating those other processes. Once you start adding heat, you lose all your nutritional density. So <laughs> I tell everyone we're doing it the hard way, but there's a reason. So by putting it into the stone grinder, we can regulate the heat of the grinder so sometimes like when it's in the middle of winter and bend we're actually insulating around this in order to make sure it doesn't go too low because if you've ever seen 20 plus pounds of chocolate get too low in temperature it turns into a giant rock and that is not a fun day um <laughs> and again same thing we're trying to keep it to where it's not going too high so how do we ventilate this how do we keep it um just churning at those right temperatures at least mm -hmm. what we view to be the right temperatures um, and then after this is stone ground, it is then poured and we have our base recipes. So, uh, we are also trying to focus on softening and sweetening our chocolates 
with cashews and coconut flakes so that we do not have to rely on sugar. So uh, when we do use sugar, which there's plenty of applications where we do, we are using coconut sugar. So it's less refined, lower glycemic index. Uh, coconut itself is very good at helping regulate blood sugar as it is. And cashews have, you know, if the FDA comes mm -hmm. after me for saying all this, believe it or not, there's a lot of health benefits for chocolate, cashews, and coconut. Um, it's all good. It's all and, good. I doubt anybody from yeah. the FDA is listening <laughs> to this podcast. Yeah, I hope not. It's a, it's, it's a really fun process to sit here and mix and match all these things and find ways to provide a delicious treat that doesn't rely on cane sugars, which is the industry standard and what, if you go read a lot of blogs, they will tell you you're supposed to use because cane sugar is what's going to bring forth the right chocolate flavor. And that's the thing is we don't believe in the right chocolate flavor. We believe in an ethical, well-sourced uh, pleasure and nourishment flavor. Um, and then from there, it just depends on what we're making. That was one of my questions so, is what are yeah. your products that you have? Um, because I know we're going to talk a little bit about the ceremonial grade cacao. So I'm curious, what are the products that, what can people buy from mythical chocolate or mythical cacao? Yes. Yeah. So we're pretty unique because uh, we mix more of your dessert chocolates and we do your ceremonial chocolates, um, which in my mind are two different things totally. So we do five different uh, bars, which are untempered bars, meaning that you keep them in the refrigerator. Um, we do, at this point, nine different flavors of truffles. So that's what I was talking about earlier. You have the ganache on the inside, that delicious creamy goodness with that hard shell on the outside. Um, and then we also do the ceremonial cacaos, which um, is a whole different process. We actually do temper those um, in order to keep them consistent and shelf stable and able to be shipped to people and sit in the ceremony space without melting and making a huge mess everywhere. Um, which, uh, yeah, we'll get to tempering, I feel like later, but a lot of, a lot of interesting questions around that. Actually, I was going to ask you about tempering because you mentioned it in the ceremonial cacao and, um, I kind of wanted to go back to the stone grinder. So, a lot of the cacao makers I know don't use a stone grinder. They use a conching right. machine. What's the difference between a conching machine and, and the stone grinder? I mean, obviously one is stone, but what's the difference between those two? And then we can get into tempering because I don't think we use that term in the first episode. And so we can talk about what that is and how that's different from Roger. Yeah, so... Um... A lot of times when they're conching, that's when you start getting back into that cacao butter, uh, cacao powder conversation. Basically, how are you piecing these things back together in such a way where you can form that ideal level of flavor and consistency? Um, so it can be done quicker because these things are already broken down to a much smaller level. I mean, butter, it's it's fat. You can just melt it on your stovetop and dump it into these machines and then powder is powder. So we're taking actual nibs. Um, so you've got really hard little pieces and you're putting into this machine and it's uh, spinning granite stones on top of a granite plate in order to slowly but surely uh, separate out the... Um, different particles that make up a nib so that your fats start releasing. And by doing that, it starts turning it into um, a liqueur is the best way to put it. So that's where you get this uh, very wet, very thick uh, chocolate paste. Um, okay. So that's kind of the quick overview of the difference. And the contour, it's like a spiral right. machine, right? It's still grinding the nib. It's just using this mechanical spiral, and usually they're metal. Right. Am I right. right about that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, nothing against them at all. Uh, it's just different processes and different belief systems. And they also cost different, like an arm and a leg for the different equipment, financial right? points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, <laughs> once you get into commercial stuff, it's all expensive, but uh, yeah, very different price points. Yeah. I mean, I've seen um, some of my friends who are makers, you know, um, like Steven, who has uh, white label chocolate and his equipment and when it malfunctions and, you know, he's got this big old vat of chocolate liqueur that he's trying to do something with. And now he can't because, you know, either his enrober doesn't work or the contour broke down or something happened. So, yes, there because there's not so many craft makers, the equipment is specialized, it's expensive, and so it makes it difficult and challenging as a craft maker to deal with these kinds of things. Totally. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. that's why you start building in redundancy when you can. Um, cause it's not something you just like, we are fortunate enough with our stone grinder and I'm handy enough to where truthfully, a lot of this stuff, I am running down to the hardware store and finding new pieces <laughs> and, uh, you're essentially rebuilding your equipment on your own. Um, Otherwise, you're waiting a long time for somebody to manufacture brand new. And um, I don't know a craft maker who isn't running to the hardware store and dealing with this kind of oh, stuff. Oh yeah, so, you yeah. you get <laughs> the chocolate is one thing, but the mm-hmm. machinery is a whole nother thing of how you get crafty. Sure. Um, and it, it at first it's very stressful, but then you realize like this is all just part of the fun. Um, sometimes I joke that chocolate's a brat (laughs) and this is why, like between the chocolate itself and the machines, like there's just so many different finicky things and it's, it's a fun little dance you get to walk into every day. I'm curious if we could go into a little bit of what is, cause I've heard about ceremonial cacao. What does that mean? What does that encompass? And I know you said it's different than the products, like the bars that you're selling. So if we could get into that, I think that'd be really great. Yeah, so this is a highly contested question. A lot of people will tell you that there is no such thing as ceremonial cacao and that people are just using fancy buzzwords to sell you something. Um, And I understand where that sentiment comes from, and I'm not going to disagree with the root issue. What I disagree with is that for us, it's all about um, creating ritual. And then once you create ritual, beginning to develop reverence. And then once you have reverence, being able to share this with others. So traditionally, uh, in the Mesoamerican cultures, there was deities associated with cacao typically viewed as feminine, but there was also masculine as well. Um, So when you sit down and really develop some reverence for this, you can, I should say, I'll stay in I statements. I have felt the spirit of cacao, and I am luckily enough to know enough people who have touched the spirit of cacao uh, and had some truly prolific experiences. So ceremonial cacao in our world is made totally different. So we're not putting all the other things in it. We're staying with just cacao primarily. We do use a little bit of cacao butter. I put it on our labels because that's how we keep the uh, stones. There you go. Lover's Elixir is one of them. Yeah. Um, For anybody who's watching the video right now, I've got a box of their ceremonial cacao. And I love this one because it's... It's very, very simple. So if I look at the ingredients, mm-hmm. I'm going to put yeah, you on the spot totally. here, Jeff. Direct trade cacao nibs, cacao butter, or cocoa butter, however you want to pronounce it, and coconut sugar. That's, that's it. it. That's all that's in yeah. here. And these are amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the butter is to keep the stones from just grinding dry stones on dry stones. So it's not meant to do anything more than that. We can just dump nibs in there but like i said it's an old cantankerous machine so we're trying to keep it healthy um so we do use a tiny amount of that but 
everything is put into that machine from absolute reverence and appreciation. And we're literally praying over it. I have two little girls, a four and a two year old who come in and before the nibs are dumped into the stone grinder, they're literally giving them well wishes, uh, telling them to enjoy their journey uh, and we'll see you on the other side. And then as we pour it out of the machine, same thing, we're talking to them and uh, thanking them um, before they're taken over. And uh, we temper our ceremonial cacao so that you can just have it sitting there wherever you are. So, what is what does that mean to temper? Yeah, uh, it's a, tempering is another one that's debated in the ceremonial realm. Uh, some say that you should not. We do it. Um, so tempering is a process where you warm the cacao liqueur up to a point, and then you cool it down and you bring it to what's known as a delta. Um, and when you're doing this, what you're doing is you're realigning the molecular structure of the cacao butter. So the fats in there. So you're aligning all these fats in such a way that they create crystals so that they interlock with one another and they're able to hold themselves in place. So untempered chocolate doesn't have these crystalline locks inside of them. So that's why at 70 degrees or so, you'll start to notice that if you just have a piece of chocolate sitting there and it's untempered, uh, if it hasn't gone through this process, uh, it won't necessarily turn into a puddle, but it, it just gets droopy and soft. And eventually, uh, as you start inching up in temperatures above that, it is going to turn into a puddle. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. If you are ready to dig deeper into your health, stop playing the wackest symptom game, start testing to get better guidance, you can find more about Terea at tereyarodriguez.com and you can find Evie at holisticallyrestored.com. Want to peek into what it's like to work with us? Come join us at our optimized wellness community. You can find the invitation link in the show notes below. And if you have a question for the show, you can submit your question under the podcast section of TereaRodriguez.com. Finally, if you found something helpful in this episode, don't forget to leave a review, hit that follow button, or share it with a friend. They're going to love that you thought of them. Until next time, see you outside.